Welcome to section 2.4. In this section, we'll be talking about the concept of row echelon matrices and the elementary row operations, which are tools that will help us in solving linear systems using matrices. So to start us off, looking at linear systems, um, it's very easy to solve a linear system using the technique of back substitution if the system is in what we call triangular form. So we saw in the previous sections the concept of an upper or lower triangular matrix. So if we look at the form of an equation like this, you can see that diagonal, that kind of triangular nature to it up here. If we have a system that is set up like this, um, we can much more easily solve the system. So the third equation here you can see already gives us the value z equals 4. We could take this value, substitute it into the second equation to solve for y equals 3, and then take both of those and substitute them back into the first equation to get out the value x equals 11 over 2. And so we would have the solution to the system simply by using back substitution. If we can put systems in this form, we can solve them much more easily. Putting systems in this form becomes a lot easier when we use matrices. So we're going to look in this section at how we can set up matrices in this form and put them in this form to help us solve more easily. Now, when it comes to actually performing operations on equations like this, we have a few different properties that we can use. So there are some things that you can do to a system of equations where no solutions to the system are gained or lost. So if we perform any of the following operations, we can interchange two equations. So like if we go back up to this equation, if I took the first equation and the second equation and I just switched their order around, that would still be the same system, right? Just the equations are listed in a different order. That doesn't change the solutions to the system. This is an operation we can perform. We use the abbreviation P sub IJ. We use P for the word permute permute, which means to switch the ith row and jth row. So P sub ij is where we permute or switch the ith row and the jth row, and it does not cost us any potential solutions. Next thing we can do, we can multiply an equation through by a constant k, as long as that constant is not equal to zero. So again, like back up here, if z equals four, and I multiply both sides of this by two, I get two z equals eight, that still has exactly the same solutions that the original did. And so we can perform this operation without changing our system. This one is abbreviated m sub i of k. So again, this is where you multiply the ith row by k. And the third one, this is where we can add a multiple of one equation to another equation. So this concept of adding a multiple of one equation to another, this is essentially the concept of uh, elimination when you study um, like substitution and elimination for studying um, algebraic systems and linear equations and stuff. Um, that's one of the methods you have to solve. Basically, we can multiply one of the equations by something and add it to another one, and the result will still have the same solutions as the ones that went into it. This is abbreviated A sub IJ of K, A for add, of course. So you add K times the ith row to the jth row. So all three of these operations can be performed on any linear system and any matrix representing a linear system in order to simplify or work towards finding a solution. And this will not change any of the solutions to the linear system. So we're perfectly allowed to do all of these. These are called elementary row operations, which you will often hear abbreviated as EROs.
elementary row operations. So we'll be using EROs a lot with matrices. Now, combining the first concept of the back substitution with this second concept of the EROs, we can apply these to the rows of an augmented matrix A. We will use this process to convert that augmented matrix A into what we call row echelon form, also abbreviated as REF. Row echelon form <clears throat> is described as follows. We say a matrix is in REF if any all zero rows are at the bottom. Okay, so if any of our equations were to get eliminated in this process, they would be moved to the bottom. And for all other rows, the first non-zero entry, which is also called the pivot, must be a one. This is called the leading one and must occur to the right of the pivot in the row above. So it must occur to the right of the pivot in the row above. So for example, if I put a big matrix in here, so I have like a one, I've got a number, a number, a number, a number, and a number. We've got 0, 0, 0, 1, number and a number, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 and a number, and then a bunch of zeros in this bottom row. So like this matrix, for example, so this is in row echelon form. The pivots, I'll often denote them using little diamonds around them or little boxes around them to indicate where those pivots are, those leading ones. So notice, again, the any all zero rows that existed were here at the bottom. For all other rows, the first non-zero entry, so you can have zero entries to the left here, but the first non-zero entry is a one in each of these cases. That's the pivot for each of those. And each of those pivots occurs to the right of the pivot in the row above it. It doesn't have to be immediately to the right as long as it's just not directly below it. Everything below a pivot should be zeros all the way down. So this would be an example of what a matrix looks like in row echelon form. So we can use our EROs, our elementary row operations, to put a matrix into REF, or row echelon form. So here's an example. So we have this 3 by 4 matrix, find row echelon form of A. So we're going to start off with the matrix... And you'll, you might find as we're going through these problems, problems with matrices like this, especially large matrices, do take up a bit of space. Um, so please be you know, cautious with how much space you're taking up for any one of these matrices because you want to make sure to have room to fit all of the steps here. Now, to put this in row echelon form, we want to have a pivot up here in this upper left-hand corner. Um, this row does not have a 1 in it. Both of these do, so we can go ahead and just switch any of these rows with the first one. So I'm going to have my little kind of tilde symbol here to indicate we're going from one matrix to the next, and we put the label right above it. We're going to use P13. So we're going to permute the first row with the third one. So 1, negative 5, 0, 5. The second row remains unchanged. And then the first row became the third. Now that we have this pivot here, 
we want to clear out everything below it. Everything below that pivot, it needs to be a zero. So we're going to use the addition ERO, that operation. I'm going to take the first row, multiply it by negative one and add it to the second row. So that's going to be addition one to two times negative one. In doing so, the first row remains the same. The second row now, you take negative one times one plus one will be zero, and that's the whole point. Negative five times negative one is five, plus negative two is three. Zero plus one is one. Five times negative one, so that's negative five plus three is negative two. And we also need to clear out the two below this pivot. So we can go ahead and perform another ERO here. We'll go ahead and add first to third row times negative two. So one times negative two plus two, that's zero. Uh, negative five times negative two is 10, minus one is nine. Zero plus three is three. 5 times negative 2, that's negative 10 plus 4 is negative 6. So you can see here we have our pivot. We have all zeros below that first pivot. So it looks like this is going to be our next pivot. Um, but what I want to do before I divide everything through by 3, because if I divide all these by 3, we're going to start getting fractions. I think it'll be easier first. Let's clear out everything below this pivot. So if we were to multiply this by negative three, that would give us negative nine, plus this nine would give us the zero down here that we're looking for. So we're gonna add second row to third times negative three. So first row remains unchanged. Second row remains unchanged. Third row, 0 times negative 3 plus 0 is 0. 3 times negative 3 is negative 9, plus 9 is 0. Uh, 1 times negative 3 is negative 3, plus 3 is 0. And 2, uh, sorry, negative 2, times negative 3 is 6, minus 6 is 0. So we ended up turning this entire last row into all zeros, right? Because this equation, this row is actually a multiple of this one. And from here now, this needs to be a pivot. So we're going to multiply the second row by one third. So we get one, negative five, zero, five, zero, one, one third, negative two thirds, Zero, 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 zero. And this matrix is in row echelon form. All right, we have the leading ones. We have our row of all zeros at the bottom. And everything below the pivot is a zero. And they are down and to the right for each other. So the first natural question that comes up is um, what if I had used other EROs? What if we had used different operations or used the same ones in a different order? Um, would we still get exactly the same thing? Well, you wouldn't necessarily get exactly the same thing, um, and that's okay. So note, so this answer is not unique. In other words, this is not the only row echelon form that we could get for this matrix. There are other ways of getting it into row echelon form. Um, like instead of permuting the first and second row, first and third rows here at the beginning, you could have permuted the first two and then gotten that one up here and then performed other operations from there. Um, there are other ways of putting a matrix in row echelon form. So there is not necessarily only exactly one way 
to solve this type of problem. Now, while rho echelon form is not unique, the number of non-zero rows, however, in rho echelon form is unique. So even though we might ha not have done all the same EROs to get to this last matrix, and we might have different results here, we should both have two non-zero rows in this row echelon form. So two out of our three should be non-zero, regardless of what the actual values are within those rows. So this number that is unique is called the rank of the matrix A. So for example, the rank of A in this previous example We had two non-zero rows in row echelon form, so the rank of the matrix is two. So no matter what values we got within those rows, all of us should have two non-zero rows within our matrices by the end. Now, we can further reduce matrices like this, um, and we can put them not only in row echelon form, but in reduced row echelon form, abbreviated RREF. In order for a matrix to be in reduced row echelon form, it must first be in row echelon form, so what we've been talking about, and in every column with a pivot, all other elements above and below are zero. So reduced row echelon form is row echelon form where we go back into this one here and we say, okay, I need to use this pivot to clear out this negative five as well. So all elements in the columns of the pivots are zeros. That would be reduced row echelon form, okay, which again does simplify the process and it can simplify our solutions, but... Um, when it comes to just row reducing, it's not necessarily an essential step for solving a system. All right. So that is our introduction to the concept of EROs and row echelon form. Now in section 2.5, we're going to look at how we can use those to actually solve linear systems of equations. Um, and this is through the method that's called Gaussian elimination. Um, but this is essentially the process of using EROs and row echelon form to solve a system of linear equations. So when you're solving a system like this, there are three possible outcomes. You can have an inconsistent system. That means you have no solution. You can have it's consistent with no free variables or you can have it's consistent with free variables. Now, what are free variables? Well, the variables that correspond to the pivots are called leading variables, while variables corresponding to non-pivots are called free variables. So if we have a case where we have no solution, it's inconsistent, that is when you have a pivot in the far right or augmented column of the matrix. So you've got all your values over in here, and then you have some pivot over here in that augmented column. That is an example where the system would have no solution, and we'll look at that a little bit later as well. If you have a system that is consistent with no free variables, in other words, every column has a pivot. So every column in the matrix going all the way down has a pivot. That is going to give us one solution. And we kind of saw an example like that earlier um, in section 2.4 at the beginning. That was the backward substitution. If your system is already in this form with a pivot in every column, that is the same form as that backward substitution. You solve this one, plug it in to solve this, plug it in to solve this. So you would get one unique solution. 
if the system is consistent with free variables, so in other words, not every column has a pivot, so there's some gaps in there, those systems are going to have infinitely many solutions. Because you might be able to solve for an exact value of this variable, but even when you substitute that back into here, you might not get one exact value for the next variable because there's no pivot there. So you're going to get a, a set of solutions in terms of these free variables. And we'll see what that looks like in a little bit. Um, but these are the three possible outcomes. You can have no solution, one solution, or infinitely many solutions. So for example, so solve if possible. Um, so let's go ahead and convert this into a matrix. So take the coefficients 1, 1, 1, and 2. And then 1, 1, 1, and 1 in the augmented column. If this is going to be a pivot here, we need to clear out everything below it. So I'm going to add first row to second times negative 1. So that's going to be, so we still have 1, 1, 1 with 2. Then we're going to clear out, so times negative 1 plus 1, that's 0. Do the same thing, 0, 0. 2 times negative 1 is negative 2, plus 1 is negative 1. And this is now the leading term. So if we go ahead and just multiply the second row by negative 1, We have a pivot here and a pivot here. This is a case, because we have that pivot in the augmented column, this is a case where the system is inconsistent or has no solutions. And you can see that if we convert this back into equations here, this one still says x plus y plus z equals 2. This system, all the coefficients are 0. This just says 0 equals 1 which of course is very much not true. So we get something that is just false by row reducing, um, which means that this system cannot have any solutions. I mean, and if you think about it, if you take three numbers that add up to two, you cannot then take the exact same three numbers and then make them add to one, right? So logically, hopefully this makes sense that we don't have any solutions to this, um, but this system, is inconsistent. So we have no solutions. So this is what can happen when you have that pivot in the far right column, in that augmented column. So let's take a look at one that's a little more involved here. So we've got this system of three equations in five variables. So to start off, let's create the augmented matrix. So we're going to take all the coefficients and put them into the components of the matrix. So that's 2, negative 3, 1, negative 1, 1, augmented with 0, 4, negative 6, 2, negative 3, negative 1, negative 5, and negative 2, 3, negative 2, 2, negative 1, and 3. Now that we have this matrix here, um, we want to go ahead and row reduce this. So we're going to use EROs, try to put it into row echelon form um, so that we can hopefully back substitute, figure out the values of these variables. So um, we know that this first component is going to be a pivot. So let's clear out everything below it. So we're going to add 1 to 2 times negative 2. That would give us, right, a negative 4. That would cancel out with that. 
So negative 2, so 2, negative 3, 1, negative 1, 1, and 0. All right, so now we add times negative 2, so that's going to give us a 0. Uh, positive 6 minus 6 is 0. Negative 2 times plus 2 is 0. That becomes positive 2 minus 3 is negative 1. And negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. And then 0 plus negative 5 is negative 5. So that's our second row. And we also can go ahead and use this row to clear out the third one. Um, as a general rule of thumb, I generally recommend not using um, too many EROs at the same time. Um, using a couple at a time is fine, or using EROs that do not affect each other is fine. So like in this case, the first row is not changing at all, and I'm using it for the second row, and I'm using it for the third row. Um, so like none of these EROs are changing things simultaneously. Like they're not affecting each other, um, so it's easier to keep it straight. I generally don't recommend using EROs at the same time if one ERO impacts the value of another. Like if you're trying to add a row here, but then you're also going to switch two rows and then also multiply this row by something else and trying to do all of that at once, it's so easy to make a mistake and to just accidentally misplace a negative, to put a number in the wrong spot, to forget to multiply one of the numbers in a row. Um, so I generally recommend one ERO at a time or a couple if they're not really connected. Um, so for this one, we're going to multiply first row times 1 and add it to the third row so that this first component becomes a 0, this one becomes a 0, this becomes negative 1, this is 1, this is 0, and this is 3. So now we're going to have a pivot up here. Um, this one would be the next pivot. However, notice this term down here is to the left of it. Um, so we can't really call this a pivot because there's something over to the left of it. Let's switch these two rows so that this one can be our next pivot up here. So we're going to permute second and third rows. So we get zero, neg uh, sorry. 0, 0, negative 1, 1, 0, 3, 0, 0, 0, negative 1, negative 3, negative 5. Just like that. And then this needs to become a 1. So we'll go ahead and multiply the first row by one half. So that's one, negative three halves, one half, negative one half, and one half, and zero. And then the second row, this negative one needs to become a one, so we'll go ahead and multiply second row by negative one. So that's zero, zero, one, negative one, zero, negative three. And same thing for the third row. So we'll multiply third row by negative one, get zero, 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 one, three, five. Now we have our three pivots in proper spacing. So they are down and to the right. Everything below the pivots is a zero. We have row echelon form. Okay. So uh, this is row echelon form of the matrix. We're going to be able to use this to help us solve the system. So each of these columns corresponds to a variable. Remember when we put these in, these were the U values, V, W, X, and Y for each of these columns. So I'm going to make a note here. Um, so the leading variables, the variables that correspond to the pivots. That's this, this, and this. So it's going to be U, W, and X. 
So u, w, and x are the leading variables. And the free variables are everything that does not have a pivot. So that's these two. That's going to be v and y. So if we look at the system again, and we look at it as a linear system now, rather than as a matrix, this is what the equations now look like now that we've performed all of these operations. So this is going to be u minus 3 halves v plus 1 half w minus 1 half x plus 1 half y equals 0. We'll have this one is w minus x equals negative 3. Trying to keep these in line with each other like the matrix. And the last one is x plus 3y equals 5. So this is the same thing as this. Now we are going to have a couple of free variables here. So like in this first equation, notice there are two variables. X is the leading variable, but Y doesn't have anything restricting it beyond this equation and this one. So um, basically what we can do is we'll say let Y equal T so we're going to give it a free variable kind of moniker here of t. Then if we were to solve this for x, we would subtract the 3y over. So x would equal 5 minus 3t. So we would take this value for x now. So because y is a free variable, t represents like a constant that can be plugged in for anything. So any value could, could get plugged in for t. So like if we said, you know, let y be 3, then x would be 5 minus 3 times 3. So 5 minus 9, which would be negative 4. Um, and we would get the x value that goes with that y value. But there's no specific condition that says y has to be this one number. That's what makes it free. So if we take this x value now, we can plug that into this equation. So we can say then w would be x minus 3, so 2 minus 3t. If we take, again, 5 minus 3t and put it into here. So we get w is this expression in terms of t, again, in terms of that free value. Then we move to our next one over. So we hit w already. Uh, next we have v is a free variable. So we're going to let v be equal to r, which again symbolizes a free variable value. Then u is going to be equal to, this is a pivoted column, so u will be in terms of all of these, but all of these are in terms of r and t. So if we you know, add and subtract all of these over to that side of the equation, we get u equals, this is 3 halves v, but instead of v, it's r minus 1 half times w, which is 2 minus 3t, plus 1 half x, which is 5 minus 3t, and then minus 1 half y, which is t. So if we simplify all of this down, this is going to give us u equals 3 halves plus 3 halves r 
minus one half t. So our solution is going to be written entirely in terms of these free variables. So our solution is going to be a set because remember, there's infinitely many solutions when a system is like this, when it has free variables. So it's going to be a set of points that are all going to be five-dimensional because there's five variables. So there will be five components here. It's the set of all points, three halves plus three halves r minus one half t, comma, r, comma, 2 minus 3t, comma, 5 minus 3t, comma, t, such that r and t are elements of the real numbers. So r and t are real numbers. So, and again, these correspond to, you know, this is U, V, W, X, and Y are the five components. But this is the general form of that solution. So, in other words, there are infinitely many points that have this relationship among its components. And we can take any of them to be a solution to this system. So, like, for example just tuck this over here into the corner so like for example if we took the r value of zero and the t value of zero just pick nice easy values if we chose those values for r and t we would get the point three halves comma zero comma two comma, five, comma, zero. Like this would be one point that solves that system of equations that was given to us. Okay, so this is one of the infinitely many solutions. And then we pick a different value for the free variables for R or for T, we would get another point and then another point and another point. And then of course, keep doing that forever to get various solutions to this system. So again, there are three possible outcomes that can occur with a system of linear equations like this. You can have no solution, like the example that we had just up above here. You can have exactly one solution, which is like the example we saw back at the beginning of the last section over here. This had exactly one solution, right? Because these all correspond ultimately to the pivots or you can have infinitely many solutions, like in this example right here. So again, this system of equations is going to have infinitely many solutions that all will have this general form to them. So I mentioned the, um, the case like we saw in that other example um, where you have a consistent system with no free variables, that's where backward substitution can help. Um, just a note, the book refers to this as Gauss-Jordan elimination. Um, so if you see like the text asking you to use Gauss-Jordan elimination, it's just asking you to like solve it from, uh, from its pivoted like row echelon form basically. So we would have one number, number, zero, one number, zero, zero, one, augmented with other numbers. So because if it's in this form, we get the value for, you know, Z that plugs into here and gives you the value for Y, those plug into here and give you the value for X, just like we saw in that other example. So if it's set up in this form, or we can get it in this form, then that's great. 
So pivot in every column, no free variables. There will be exactly one answer, and we can use backward substitution to find that. So let's look at another example here, something a little bit different, where we can think about all of these possible outcomes in one problem. Determine the values of k such that the system below has either no solution for part A, has one solution, or for part B, has infinite solutions. So if we go ahead and take this system and set it up as an augmented matrix, we're going to get 1, 2, negative 1, augmented with 3. We're going to get 2, 5, 1, 7, 1, 1, negative k squared, and negative k. So before we come up with any potential solutions, um, let's get to work on the row reductions here. So we already do have the looks of a pivot up here in this corner. Let's go ahead and add first row to second and to third to clear out everything below that pivot. So we're going to add first to second times negative two. We're going to add first to third times negative one. So one two, negative one, three. All right, so we get zero, that's negative four plus five is one, positive two and one is three, negative six plus seven is one, and then one times negative one plus one is zero, negative two plus one is negative one, that's positive one, minus k squared, so 1 minus k squared there, and negative 3 minus k, so negative 3 minus k right there. So we can see this pivot and its adjacent column is set up. This is going to be our next pivot, so we need to go ahead and clear out beneath that. So we're going to add 2 to 3 times 1. So 1, 2, negative 1, and 3. 0, 1, 3, 1. 0, 0. We're going to have 3 plus this 1 here, so that's 4 minus k squared. And then 3 plus this negative 3 minus k, oh, I'm sorry, plus um, the 1, yeah, so 1 minus, there we go, so minus 2 minus k, there we go, yeah, 1 times 1, and then plus the negative 3 there, and then from here, um, this would be fine as is, but let's go ahead and just multiply this row through by negative 1, just so that we can make it look a little nicer, so multiply third row by negative 1, so we get 1, 2, negative 1, with 3, we get 0, 1, 3 with 1, 0, 0, k squared minus 4, and k plus 2. Okay, now, whether this system has no solution, one solution, or infinitely many solutions purely depends on where these pivots are in this matrix, in its row echelon form. We already have pivots here and here. So those columns are taken care of. Now, if we have the case where there's no solution, if there's no solution, that means you're going to have to have a pivot here in the augmented column and have a zero here, because if there wasn't a zero here, that would become the pivot. Okay, so to have no solution, k squared minus 4 equals 0, and k plus 2 must not be 0. Right, and again, this gives us pivot in 
the augmented column. So if we look at what the solutions are here, uh, we have k equals plus or minus 2, but this second condition tells us k must not be equal to negative 2. So we're going to have one solution when k equals 2, right? Because we need this one to be something non-zero, so that would be either plus or minus 2, or excuse me, that would be anything other than negative 2. But we need this one to be a 0, so that's got to be one of these two choices. So we eliminate the one case it can't have, we're left with positive 2. So if k was 2, this last row would be 0, 0, 0, 4. We would have a pivot there, we could turn it into a 1, and then we would have no solution. For part B, looking for exactly one solution. We get exactly one solution when there is a pivot in every column. So to have, oh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong back here, didn't I? That was, that was no solution. No solution when k equals 2. That's better. Uh, so to have one solution, so actually to have one solution, uh, we need a pivot in this third column. <clears throat> so k squared minus 4 must not be 0. It doesn't have to be 1 right now. It just has to be any, another, any other number besides 0, and then we could turn it into a 1 if we needed to. Um, so... That just means k cannot equal plus or minus 2. Okay, so we have pivot in the third column. One solution when k is not equal to plus or minus 2. So any number other than those two will give this one unique solution. And then part C for infinite solutions. So we need a free variable. So unpivoted column. So in other words, this needs to be a zero so that we don't have a pivot here. So we have a free variable there. And this also needs to be a zero so that we don't accidentally get a pivot in the augmented column. So k squared minus 4 must be zero. And k plus 2 must be equal to zero. So we have infinite solutions when this gives us k equals plus or minus 2. But this one gives us k equals negative 2. So the only solution they both have in common is when k equals negative 2. And there we have our three potential outcomes. So if k is 2, we get a pivot in the far right column, and so this system has no solution. If k is negative 2, we have a pivot in this third column, meaning that it is consistent. We have no free variables. We can just back substitute and get one unique solution. And if k is anything other than 2 or negative 2, um, then, oh, did I say that backwards? I think I said that backwards. Yeah, no solution was when k is 2, because that's a 0, and that's a 4. So that becomes our pivot. 
we have infinite solutions when k is negative 2 because that becomes a 0 and that becomes a 0, and that gives us a free variable here. And if k, there we go, if k is anything else besides 2 or negative 2, that's what gives us the pivot here, which then gives us the one unique solution. All right. So this brings us to the end of section 2.5, uh, concluding our introduction into element, elementary row operations, uh, row echelon form, and how we can use those to solve systems of equations, obtaining either one solution, infinitely many solutions, or no solutions, depending on the form of the matrix. When we come back in the next couple of sections, uh, we're going to continue using these tools to expand upon our understanding of matrices, and we start looking at the concept of the inverse of a matrix, which is going to be critically important for the rest of our work this semester.